In the third episode of The Last Airbender, The Southern Air Temple, we see Aang having to come to grips with the hard truth that his entire nation, the Air Nomads, were completely wiped out in a genocide. That his mentor and father figure Monk Gyatso is dead. He is the last airbender. All this in the very beginning of the story. Both The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra make it pretty abundantly clear that Aang, his son Tenzin, and his children are the last of the airbenders, and the show doesn't really play this as a subtle fact. I mean, it's even in the title of the original show. But what if I told you that that's actually not true? That in reality, not all of the airbenders were wiped out. That Aang, in fact, well, he isn't the last airbender. Top thinks you give pretty good advice and great tea. The key to both is proper aging. The simple fact of the matter is, a few airbenders actually escaped. And this isn't some twisting of words, it's completely canon, in fact. Readers of the last Airbender comics will know that this was first revealed in the short comic strip Relics, which you can find in the book The Lost Tales. In the comic, Aang discovers an old airbender pendant in an Earth Kingdom market. Believing that this may be a sign of other airbenders, he explores the region and comes across an ancient airbender site containing old relics. This, however, ends up being a trap set by Admiral Zhao in an attempt, which succeeds, to capture Aang. He reveals that the relics and the pendant were a setup to lure the Avatar in. The same tactic was used many years ago by Fire Lord Sozin, he says. The few airbenders that escaped the first assault were too hard to hunt down. Instead, he laid traps for them. In an old Avatar trading cards game, we find two named airbending survivors, Malu and Afiko. And while the game isn't directly confirmed to be in canon, the two characters do demonstrate that the creators definitely intended a handful of airbenders to survive the genocide. Now, while Afiko was eventually killed off by Fire Lord Sozin, even after literally helping lead the Fire Lord to the Air Temples to kill his own people, I might add, we're never really told exactly if Malu met the same fate, though. We do know that she lived in solitude in the mountains of the Earth Kingdom and was supposed by the Earth Kingdom citizens to control the spirits and vanish at will, both abilities from her airbending. But how was it exactly that these few airbenders managed to escape the first attacks? Well, to understand that, we first need to understand a little bit about the structure of air nomad culture. The first item is that all known air nomads were airbenders. Unlike the other nations, there's no mention of any non-bending air nomad prior to the Hundred Year War. And even after the war, one could argue that technically the air acolytes weren't necessarily air nomads. Sure, they followed the traditions and upheld the culture, but they weren't air nomads in the sense that we're referring to. So it's pretty safe to assume here that a non-bending air nomad simply wasn't and isn't a thing. I come seeking boring stories to take back to the spirit world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now file that away because I have some evidence as to why that could be the case, and also this will be an important point later on. Air temples were also divided based on gender, with the boys residing in the southern and northern temples and the girls in the western and eastern temples, although all airbenders eventually did come to the eastern temple to bond air bison. However, while the airbenders did live in their temples, they also traveled quite often following their nomadic traditions. Aang often talks about his travels to the Fire Nation, the desert, and the Earth Kingdom, and even the other air temples. Now, when the Hundred Year War came about and the Fire Nation began their assault on the air nomads, their first strike was specifically directed on the air temples, as we see in the episode The Southern Air Temple. So all the air nomads outside the temples would have evaded the first attack, right? It's absolutely likely that these airbenders would have heard of this massive genocide that is occurring on their people, and so use the same tactic that we see many, many persecuted peoples throughout real world history using. They hid and blended in with society. It's commonly thought that the majority of the surviving air nomads hid in the northern mountains of the Earth Kingdom, which was also the Fire Nation colonies, which is also near Yudao and Yue Bay. We find Malu, one of the named survivors, doing this exact thing. On an interesting side note, which will become more relevant later, in Book 3 of Legend of Korra, Korra and Tenzin set off in search of new airbenders and actually end up finding the majority of these benders in the exact same area, which by this time is the United United Republic. Anyway, as Zhao stated, Sozin tried to capture and kill as many of these survivors as he could possibly get his hands on, and so set up these air nomad relic traps all around the Earth Kingdom. And it's pretty clear that the Fire Nation truly believed that they had killed every last one of the airbenders except Aang. Yet, I don't believe that was totally true. While these traps certainly worked to capture a number of 
these survivors, news would have most definitely spread about these traps, and the remaining handful of airbenders would have certainly avoided them. So airbenders definitely survived the first purge. However, the conclusion does raise one burning question, and that is, well, where'd they all go during Avatar? In The Last Airbender, there's zero mention of any airbenders in the world. The Legend of Korra takes place 70 years after the end of the Hundred Year War, and by this time you would think if there were any airbenders left, they would have revealed themselves 70 years after the threat to their lives is gone. Legend of Korra is pretty clear in stating that Tenzin and his three children are the only airbenders left in the world. So, what happened? Well, the most probable answer is that they would have died off in the hundred year span between the genocide and the end of the war that we see in Last Airbender, and especially in the 170 years between the genocide and when Korra begins. But what about their descendants? It's pretty unlikely that none of them would have had children or even grandchildren. When the airbenders settled, they likely would have had families of their own. So where are these descendants? Wouldn't they have inherited their parents' bending abilities? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand how bending in general works. While not outrightly stated in either show, the creators have confirmed that bending works by the user controlling the flow of chi within their own body and extending it outward, reaching for the element they wish to manipulate. Control of the elements also depends heavily on the spirituality of the bender. The more attuned spiritually a bender is, the stronger they are. Air Nomads had a huge emphasis on spirituality, more so than any other nation, and this is most likely the case for why all Air Nomads were benders. Since the entire nation itself is so spiritually attuned, every one person grows up in an environment that's hyper-focused on one's spirituality. Not only did the nation itself rely on spirituality, but airbending in of itself depends greatly on it, more so than any other element. This is especially demonstrated through Janora's spiritual projection abilities, and also Zahir and Guru Lahima's abilities to fly, both being feats that depend more so on the spirituality of the bender, not just connection to one's chi. Check out my latest invention, an airbender finder. Wait, that can find airbenders? Uh, I think it's broken. It's not broken, she needs to airbend into it. How else do you expect the thing to work? So how does this answer why there were no airbenders after the Hundred Year War? Following the logic of a benders, and especially an airbender spiritual connection, it's highly plausible that the descendants of the surviving airbenders would have lost that special connection. They're living in a war-torn world, where we see spirituality and one's connection to it almost completely ignored and lost, hence why we don't see any airbenders by the time the Hundred Year War ends. Now by the time Legend of Korra comes about, we still don't see any airbenders until after harmonic convergence. And after that, there's a sudden resurgence of all these airbenders. One interesting thing to note is that all of these new airbenders pop up around the Fire Nation colonies, which is now the United Republic, which is also exactly where most of the original airbending survivors settled. It's never stated directly why all of a sudden we find these random non-benders starting to manifest airbending. Yet when you think about the timing and the place, it doesn't seem too far off to assume that maybe these new airbenders were the descendants of the surviving air nomads. As previously mentioned, these descendants wouldn't possess the capability to airbend because of their lack of spiritual connection, but harmonic convergence bringing about this huge spiritual shift in the world, not to mention Korra opening both spirit portals, combining the spirit and mortal worlds together, may have been the exact spiritual shift that was needed to awaken the airbending powers in these non-benders. This actually makes complete sense when you consider Aang's son, Bumi, a non-bender and the son of an air nomad survivor, who suddenly developed airbending abilities after harmonic convergence. As stated in the show, Boomy seemed to be a late bloomer when it came to airbending. This could have been partly due to the fact that Aang didn't exactly give Boomy the attention or even the spiritual training he needed to develop his abilities. Instead, it was diverted all to Tenzin, who had already developed his abilities. Wait until I tell mom. She's gonna love this. And throughout Korra, it's definitely shown that Bumi did indeed have a stronger connection to the spirit world than Tenzin did. But it wasn't only Bumi who developed these abilities. So here, the villain in Book 3 was also shown to have manifested these new airbending skills, and he actually puts a pretty large hole in this theory. Following the theory assumes that Zaheer had airbending ancestors, which is quite possible, yet the theory also makes the assumption that none of the descendants of air nomads developed their bending because of a lack of spiritual connection. 
Now Zaheer is clearly shown to have a spiritual connection already, with his seemingly infinite knowledge of Guru Lahima's teaching in air nomad culture. Guru Lakshmir. Guru Lahima. Right. You know, I can never keep all those gurus straight. And this leads one to wonder why he wouldn't have developed his airbending sooner. Any number of answers could be given, none of all which are exactly believable. One suggests that Zaheer originally did have airbending and was even trained by Aang himself. Yet at some point, his bending was removed by Aang, like he did to Yakone and Ozai, maybe because of his alignment with the Red Lotus. Really though, I can't exactly see how this would have been the case. I feel like this most definitely would have been mentioned somewhere in the show if that was true. Another thought is that maybe Zaheer wasn't as spiritually connected prior to being locked away for 13 years. And maybe during his time in jail, he studied Guru Lahima and sought spiritual enlightenment. While this argument has more merits, I can't really see why the Red Lotus would allow this to occur, knowing how dangerous and powerful Zaheer already is as a non-bender. The most plausible reasoning I can find is that even though Zaheer was spiritually in tune, just like Bumi was, he still wasn't as connected as the bending required, not being trained as Tenzin had been, or even the other airbenders prior to the genocide. And some evidence for this is the fact that Zaheer was never shown to enter the spirit world before harmonic convergence. Afterward, however, we see him entering Jaibao's grove to talk to Korra. He even guides Korra into the spirit world himself in book four. But we never see him doing any of this before harmonic convergence. Harmonic convergence eventually gave him that spiritual shift, which could also be a possible explanation as to why his airbending was so much more advanced than the other newfound benders. Anyway, let me know what you think of these thoughts. This was super fun for me to write, even though this isn't exactly my usual type of content. I'm really wanting to have more video essays, theories, and these interesting lore videos in the future. I'm hoping to get a good mix of this type of content and writing help. Well, I hope this gave you some interesting new knowledge on airbenders in this universe, and I'll see you in the next video.